You guys know how to say my last name? Uh, it's shirt, like sir. shirt. Wait, sir. Yeah, shirt, sir. Yeah, I didn't shirt, that. sir. Shirt, yeah. sir. Got it. Yep. And we are rolling. Hello and welcome to, or welcome back to Colonial Outcasts, your neighborhood anti-imperialist podcast. I'm Greg Stoker, and I'm joined, as per usual, by Mark Wayne. And today we are yet again centering Palestine, the rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation in Gaza, and this expression of late-stage colonial violence that it's experiencing. So it's been a few days since Aaron Bushnell, a cyber specialist in the U.S. Air Force, performed an extreme act of protest in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. It's caused shockwaves around the world. And I was just asked today by an old acquaintance who became aware that I have a somewhat non-insignificant activism platform on social media if being pro-Palestine was anti-Semitic. And for a second, I was like, oh, my God, are we back at square one? And this is good because I think for a lot of people uh, going forward, we actually might be. So um, I realized two things. Aaron Bushnell's action is going to make some people start asking questions. And those people are, are going to, you know, be starting from square one when it comes to the Israel-Palestine question. So to help us hash this out for people, um, we have Michael Scherzer, comedian and activist who is incidentally Jewish and anti-Zionist, which we'll get into in a second. And he hosts, co-hosts the Palestine Pod, a podcast that breaks down the latest Palestine-related news with commentary and interviews mostly every week. So the links for that are uh, in the description below. And uh, thanks for coming on, Michael. Thank you so much for having me and sharing your platform. Yeah. All right. So uh, we kind of here just like to open on action. But before uh, we play a clip from last night's Seth Meyers show where Joe Biden self-identifies as a Zionist. And bear in mind, Joe Biden is Catholic. Uh, I was hoping you could define our terms and give us a short description of what Zionism is in a nutshell, if that's possible. I'm sure everybody understands the term anti-Semitism as inherently bad. Uh, but what is Zionism for the newcomers? Sure. A really easy way to distinguish between Judaism and Zionism is Judaism is a religion that has been around for thousands of years, and Zionism is a settler colonial project that is predicated on genocide and forced ethnic displacement. And so, you know, an even simpler way is Judaism says, do not kill and do not steal, and Zionism says, kill everyone and steal everything. Yeah, I would agree with that definition. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, incidentally, uh, Mark was a Christian Zionist growing up in the evangelical tradition. Am I correct? Yeah. And um, I took that to the bank when I went to Israel just as a result of me being a Zionist to learn and study and learn more about Zionism to my disappointment. It's like impossible to discuss anti-Semitism without first establishing that Zionism is the source of the majority of anti-Semitism and bad feelings that exist towards Jewish people worldwide. worldwide. Uh, that said, the discussion of anti-Semitism is used time and time again as a trick, according to former Minister of Communications Shulamit Alomi, who admitted so much on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman many years ago. When asked about weaponizing anti-Semitism, she says it's a trick they always use it. If their critics are in the U.S., they are anti-Semitic. And if they're in Europe, Zionists will weaponize the Holocaust. And then you have recent statements coming from the Knesset, like May Golan, uh, somebody who said, even 80 years from now, everyone will tell their grandchildren what the Jews did, right? So you see the same Zionist anti-Semitic rhetoric that comes uh, you know, full force anytime you hear a Zionist speak truly. Yeah. And uh, just to be perfectly clear, w when we say call Zionism a settler colonial project, we are referring to the establishment of the state of Israel and the perpetuation of that project. Correct. I refer to it to, as the occupation of Palestine. I Like the only Israel that I recognize is UFC fighter Israel Adesanya. Okay. Got it. So we're going to play this uh, clip by Joe Biden from last night, and uh, and you can kind of break it down for us or react however you, you feel is uh, warranted. All right, here we go. Last night from Seth Myers. Every day we see these horrible images out of Gaza. And is there a path forward? Is there a safe future 
for the people who live there? Look, first of all, there are the hostages being held must be released. Ramadan's coming up and there's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. That gives us time to begin to move in directions that a lot of Arab countries are prepared to move in. For example, Saudi Arabia is ready to recognize Israel. Jordan, is, uh, Egypt, uh, there are six other states I've been working with, Qatar. The only way Israel ultimately survives... He them, forgot them. I make no bones about it. I get <laughs> criticized for having said a long time ago, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. I'm a Zionist. Where there's no Israel, there's not a exactly. Jew in the world to be safe. Every day. Yeah, and that's something we hear uh, a lot from the Zionist camp. Uh, the establishment of the state of Israel is based. It's the only way the Jew, Jews can survive in this world. Yeah, it was nice of him to take a break from eating ice cream to tell me how unsafe I am in my own country. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? right? The one that he's supposedly in charge of. Um, but we all know his brains are scrambled eggs. Uh, and it's wild that he would center the Zionist hostages at a time when there are literally Palestinians under the rubble right now. There are Palestinians who are starving to death, right? They don't have food. They don't have water. And you, the first thing that he is, because we all know his brain is not fully there, but the first thing that he is able to remember is that he has to say something about the hostages, right? Yeah. That's the first talking point. He knows he needs to hit that talking point. And if he doesn't hit that talking point, what happens, right? Somebody gets mad. Um, and so it's like, Far more Palestinians have been arrested since October 7th than have been released in any prisoner exchange. Right now, there's easily like between seven and 9,000 Palestinian prisoners languishing in Zionist dungeons. The majority of them have never even committed a crime, right? And that includes more than 2,000 of them who are being held by administrative detention, which is whereby the Zionist military just detains a person without charge or trial. It can be renewed indefinitely, right? Based on secret information. And then the detainee isn't even allowed to see it. So it's like these Zionist dungeons hold children, human rights defenders, Palestinian political prisoners. I mean, it's... And and I hate the name. I hate the name administrative detention. It sounds like you're going to the principal's office. Exactly. They're They're fucking... they're torture. They're torture chambers. Exactly. It's People, not detention. Death it's, it's not. They're death. Yeah, it's not. De- yeah. It's. I've heard horror stories where they'll take an, a minor, uh, put them in one of these dungeons, right? Yeah. And they'll tell their parents, okay, if you want to even come see or or hire a lawyer, you have to spend like what is it like ten thousand bucks? You know, it's extreme. And, they're trying to ruin every single family every time they abduct a child through legal fees. The Bernat brothers is an example. Mm. The Bernat brothers were abducted many years ago. They've been languishing in Zionist dungeons under the auspices of administrative detention. Go- Google uh, the Bernat brothers. Yeah, and then you learn that they're they're being raped, and you'll hear, hear stories of like they where a family member was able to get a lawyer to go see one of their relatives in prison. The lawyer would, you know, contact them and actually see them. There are multiple fractures, broken arms, you know, bruised eyes. And yep. then the lawyer would go tell the family members, listen, your child is beat the f*** up, but do not mention that publicly or else they'll get wind of it and actually treat them worse. So exactly. I just want to let you know. Like, imagine the psychological torture a parent would go through knowing that shit. So we, we, we know about, we, I think people are becoming aware of the effects of Zionism, how it's as an ideology, it's effectuated on the ground and through bureaucracy, through political systems. Um, but I, I guess people are, are wondering, like, how does how, how does that ideology like take root, and how does it translate into phys- like phys- physical action on the ground? Like, how does it? Yeah. How do people use it to justify these actions that we're seeing on Instagram, on the news, uh, that people are burning themselves alive in protest against? Yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the largest and most complex propaganda brainwashing systems known to mankind, right? Zionism is. It has one of the most well-funded PR campaigns behind it, right? It's able to intimidate any political opponent. Even Obama was on record as saying that if you say anything negative about AIPAC, you'll have a well-funded primary challenger immediately, 
right? Filed before the paperwork was even allowed type shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think some people are wising up to the idea that we as Jewish people have been fed a large lie, right? About mm-hmm. the occupation of Palestine, right? Because the, like the brainwash is so comprehensive that it starts basically from birth, right? Like mm-hmm. you, all of your social institutions, all of your friends, all of your, you know, your temples, all of your like job and political opportunities are connected to supporting genocide, right? And so everything kind of leads you down that path. And like, I don't know if you guys know my story, but I only came to when I was in a fraternity, uh, AE Pi, it's a Jewish fraternity, and they were hazing us. Like, mm-hmm. um, we, were, we had our hands tied behind our backs and we were blindfolded. It's what y'all would call black bagging, essentially, I'd imagine, yeah. but just like without mm-hmm. the actual physical bag. Um, and they were playing loud music. It was sensory deprivation torture. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was like eight or 10 like American guys. And then like two guys who had served in the occupation army and they were also tied up with us. And the Americans were super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like everybody would, we'd never been tortured before. And, but the, uh, the Zionists, those guys, they, we're like laughing and joking. And you know, when you're tied up, you're, you're blindfolded, your other senses kind of take hold. So hearing them laugh was just like wicked. And I was like, what is up with you guys? You guys are giving off psycho vibes right now. And they were like, we used to do this to Palestinians all the time. Like they Holy told shit. me so proudly. And then they told me a ton of other stuff that I don't like to remember. And mm-hmm. it just like, you know, set me down this path where I was like, oh my God, literally everybody has lied to me about this thing in my life. And, you know, I interacted more with Palestinians. I started reading books written by Palestinians and also some written by uh, Israelis as well. And, you know, I, I looked into like Norman Finkelstein and the speech where he talks about alligator tears really invigorated me and awakened me to the fact that like, No, they've been pimping out our trauma through the Holocaust in order to Mm -hmm. further a political agenda that is predicated on the eradication of the Palestinian people. And many Jews just aren't fucking having it anymore. I've spoken to Rabbi Brant Rosen, who is in Sedek, Chicago. That's the first Jewish American anti-Zionist reform congregation to like make anti-Zionism a part of their core values. And then I've spoken to Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, who is a uh, Orthodox rabbi. He's in New York and he leads a congregation. He's been a rabbi for over 30 years. He wrote the book, The Empty Wagon, How Zionism Stole Jewish Identity. Yeah. And, and, and one thing that we wanted to touch on, of course, is uh, get your thoughts on like how is, in the most basic terms, Zionism anti-Semitic. How is how is the most anti-Semitism you've experienced been from Zionist elements? Yeah, so all the time I get anti-Semitic messages coming from Zionists, right? They tell me that they wish that I'd been in the Holocaust. They call me a capo, which is somebody who coordinated with Nazis. They tell me that I'm not a real Jew. They have tried to get me banned from places. Zionists have actually reached out to every single major comedy club in Los Angeles trying to make sure I don't get booked there. Joke's on them. I already don't get booked there. Thank you so much. Okay. (laughs) Uh, They also, they send me threats, like death threats all the time. Um, They, the other day, they sent me a message where they were like, we are going to cut out your tongue. And I was like, dog. That's fucked up. You guys know I love to eat pussy. Okay, what's going on? Um, <laughs> you are reading my text, and I wish you would stop. Okay, that's a little Pegasus joke. Thank you so much. Uh, they have actually. Hey, Greg, do we have to edit that out. <laughs> no, we'll let, keep let... that. Okay, cool. Wi-Fi was loading. 
Uh, they have doxed me. They have contacted my parents. They harassed me online for many years now. They put me on Canary Mission in an effort to blacklist me from getting any work. <laughs> I'm already not getting work. Thank you so much. And uh, there like, is some other actual legal stuff that I can't even talk about on record right now. <laughs> like, I can't publicly state. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been a lot. And, you know, there's a, that's just like, that's the overt stuff, right? Like, that does not even include people who have just stopped talking to me, stopped booking me slowly backed away from me like I'm fucking radioactive right like you really only learn about what it's like when it start when it starts happening to you like there's no way to prepare how people receive you until you've got a target on your back people are either like super happy to see you because you mean something like you're you're like they support what you're doing or you know they part like the red sea to get away from your like general vicinity yeah. And that's uh, one of the questions I always going to ask you is, you know, besides Greg already asked what kind of attacks you've experienced, how has it divided Jewish families? Describe how that's happening. Yeah, it's really difficult. Uh, you know, my family has, I would say, a wide variety of opinions. I've had cousins who've reached out to me to tell me that they are embarrassed to be related to me. And it's like, we don't even share the same last name. What are you talking about? Like, who knows that, right? You're so insanely dramatic. Uh, and then it's like, other people have disowned me, disavowed me, disavowed any connection to me. And then I had one cousin who was super supportive. She actually does share my last name. And her input was like, occupation isn't cute, honey. Like, you know what I mean? So it really depends on who you ask. Um, yeah. Even Even my parents have had like, They've gotten insane messages from Zionists, uh, some in our family, some outside. And my parents have had to be like, Michael's a grown man. He's allowed to have his own opinions, right? And my parents and I don't always agree, right? But I think they understand the importance of the work and they support me, which is so greatly appreciated. Yeah, that's, that's kind of been my experience with my parents on the subject. And it was actually me that had an influence on their opinion on that after I went to Israel and had a very organic departure from Zionism. It was yeah. very organic because I became best friends with the Palestinians over there. And it wasn't because I'm like an activist. I, I did not yeah. choose to be pro-Palestinian. It chose me in the sense that I got a per I got on a very personal basis with Palestinians and they saw me as family. And these dudes would fucking die for me. They're, they're ride or die dudes. When you, when you become friends with a Palestinian on an yes. organic level, yes. it's that bond there's nothing that could break that 100%. like to this day. And that was like back, that was back in 2005. And I never that, went, sorry to interrupt. I never went on their so-called well, birthright. I was going to ask you, I did, yeah. did, okay, you it, didn't go with the Aliyah. No, 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 no. I, I mean, okay. I could tell it was weird from the very beginning because like oh. I grew up in between like being born in New York and raised in Los Angeles. When somebody yeah. offers you, me a free trip somewhere, I'm skeptical, right? Like, Anywhere, like, wait, 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 wait. it's the old free? proverb where it's, it's like, if it's free, then you are the product, right? <laughs> and then I learned later that they do it because they want to brainwash people even more. Like it's their effort. They get, they take them on like oh. a North Korea guided tour where they're like, you know, <laughs> like, yes, he, the, the thing they are, they were so weird because they were offering me a free trip. They're like, oh, you're indigenous to this place. I was like, my boy, I was born in New York. You know what I mean? Like I'm indigenous to the L train. Maybe I don't know what you're talking about. Like. Uh, and so, you know, I was skeptical from the very beginning and I was also like coming into anti-imperialism in college just, and so it wasn't really a leap to be like, okay, wow, the occupation of Palestine is clearly a settler colony, a base over there that they use as an outpost, as an outpost for military ventures. Right. And they're even like, you know, sending soldiers from the population of the United States as reinforcement. Um, and there are U.S. soldiers on the ground fighting in tunnels right now. That was reported by Bison. And um, I think Aaron Bushnell actually published some information that let us know that as well. Yeah, I, I've been asked to comment on that. I am not going to at this time. Um, okay, it's not beyond fair. the realm of it's not beyond the well, realm of possibility, of course. Because Bison, Bison said it, and that's good enough for us, right? Bison is a is a primary source on the ground. And also, we right. saw that video not too long ago 
of that guy who was clearly like a U.S. Marine or something leading kind of like a semicircle of people. And he was like, we're going to drop enough nukes to scare God Almighty himself. Okay, he was giving like a Southern sermon. Uh, and oh. so it's like, yeah, dude, oh, we know I they've been on the that, ground. Yeah. Um, and also it's like, if God gave you the land, why are you bombing it? Very rude. Okay. Very, very rude. Yeah. You grew up evangelical so, uh, Christian, you said though? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you know, I grew, I grew up with all the Bible stories about the Israelites kicking ass, right. you know, uh, and you get wrapped up in that mythology. And I'm not saying that's mythological because I am a biblical literalist. I still am a yeah. strong Christian. So when I went to Israel, it was of my own accord. After after high school, you know, I grew up on military bases. I told my parents, hey, I want to go to Jerusalem and study at Hebrew University. My parents were like, right on. Let's do it. And at that time, I, I was what I call a brochure Zionist. See, the, the version of Zionism they always feed everybody is the brochure. So, like, if you go outside a church of Scientology and they give you a brochure, what's it going to say on the brochure? We're about the betterment of humanity and psychological repairing and psychological, all that, all, you know, the beautiful thing. But obviously when you get higher up in the ranks, we know how dark it gets, you know? And no, Greg, we're not fucking editing that out, dude. There's already a documentary on that shit. So what, anyways, what, why are you acting like I'm the fascist censorship? I'm here? joking. I'm fucking, <laughs> I'm fucking, I'm fucking, yeah. All right. So I was a, I was a, I was a level one brochure Zionist, you know, it's like, Hey, do you think that the Jews should have a safe place to live in and in in their own sovereignty? I'm like, Fuck yeah. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Fuck yeah. Yeah. I'm like, let's go to, I'm going to go to Israel. I'm going to join the IDF. I'm going to be the most badass non-Jewish pro-Israeli ever, bro. Ooh, <laughs> so gross. Dude, actually, I, I forgot. Oh, you oh, oh, to join oh, the oh, IDF. oh, that's actually a Greg, great Greg, segue. Great. Great. Greg, the cringe is coming. Mm -hmm. We haven't even got yeah. to the juicy part. All right. Yeah. Mind you, I'm okay, Bush really. what's, what's the segue? That's a great segue that back into what uh, Genocide Joe was saying about how you don't need to be a Jew to be a Zionist, right? And I would say that it actually is harder to be a Jew if you're a Zionist and because it's Zionist. like a lot of what we do is very opposite of what they're doing, you know? So, I mean, let's talk about like, why Christians are Zionists in the first place? Because they believe that yes. all the Jews are going to, most, most of the Jews, like two thirds yes. of them are going to be destroyed we'll be. in the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus comes down. So it's like, oh yes. yeah, fuck yeah. Let's get the Jews over there. Let's protect them so that they're going to die in the future. And the Messiah can come back and we get to go to heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, and by the way, all the Jews are going to hell. <laughs> like, like, what the fuck is that wrong with you? Is exactly why a hundred million Christian Zionists in the United States support the occupation of Palestine, right? That's why there's so like that they fundraisers <laughs> so that they can die, so that Jews can be killed at the hands of a biblical prophecy. And it's yeah. so funny that like, you know, Christian Zionists think, because they actually think that one third will convert and then two thirds will die. And I love that they're doing math for us. That's very nice. And also, uh, it's like, that's how I know that they don't know any Jews, right? Because it's like, Jews would literally burn in hell before losing an argument, okay? Not a chance. <laughs> no, I I was not of that camp, thank God, that yeah. believed that two-thirds was going to die. I thought that was a mistranslation of Revelation. And But so when I went over Is there, it? I don't know. You could be putting me on. Maybe. But, uh... It, when I went over there, you know, I go, I, I'm on an airplane with, I was the, me and only one other dude were the only non-Jews on that airplane. The most of mm. them were American Jews from New York, Washington, all over. We're all yeah. going to Hebrew University. A lot of them had already done Aliyah. And mm. at the time, I really hadn't been around a lot of Jewish people, uh, you know, before that. Besides rabbis through my dad being a chaplain in the army, I had, I had, a, I had kind of a reputation in the in the rabbi world in the sense through my dad and they had a good relationship and they had, you know, but when I went to Israel, when I went to Israel, you know, I'm, of course I have all these ideas filled in my head. They're a righteous army. These are the ancient Israelites. Mm. Um, but I wasn't, but for me, I was never racist against Arabs. That was never a thing for me, but I was anti-Muslim. Right. So for me, was it was that a from religious just growing up time. in the U S or what? No, that just goes from Wednesday night at church. When, like uh, when they show you the slideshows of Islam is the next conspiracy. They're, they're a cons it's a conspiracy theory about Islam is taking over the world. Right now, 
so when I arrived, you know, I was excited. And as irony would have it, they assign each, when you show up to Hebrew University, they assign you your dorm. Uh, really quick, really quick. Yeah. Being like, yeah, I'm yeah. not anti-Arab. I just hate Islam is so funny to me, right? That's like, uh, <laughs> oh, no, yeah. oh, no, I, no, no. I don't hate Jews. I just fucking hate locks and bagels, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, no, I, my, my, my train of thought at the time was so beyond fucked, you know? I, I, I can't even defend it. So we're talking about a lot of cringe. But I'm going to admit to it. I'm not going to hide it. Yeah, I'm no, it's good that you're talking about it. Yeah, no, I'm going to be completely honest with you, no matter how mm -hmm. cringy it is. But when I got there, they assigned you dorm rooms, and they assigned me to my dorm. I went to the dorm, thinking that I was going to go to a dorm room, a dorm floor that was full of Israelis or American Jews. Guess what? They're all Palestinian Muslims. Mm -hmm. And the first night, the first night, I see there's a, a door open, and these guys were just being really loud and having a good time. I'm like, I want to, I want to get to know these guys a little bit. They're Palestinian, speaking Arabic. The first thing I said to what, what would become, who would become my future best friends, was, "What's up, you terrorist motherfuckers?" Whoa. First thing I said. Now, a third of the room was laughing. A third of the room wanted to kick my ass. The other third wanted to kick my ass and was laughing at the same time. And they're and they were so chill about it. They said who the fuck is this white guy who just walked into our dorm? And I, and I was like, I'm just playing, guys. And then we started smoking hookah, eating pita bread, and I was spewing out all the propaganda bullshit I was taught. Like, I heard Islam means submission. And one of my Palestinian friends said, to God, you dumb shit. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I didn't know that. And then Did they you started think it was jiu What were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, they... They were um, tap out at that moment in that hour of having Jesus love to tap, dude. They unfucked my head in that one hour. They did 10 years of unfucking my head and we wow. became best friends that day. And I went to all their villages. I went to the West Bank. I, we wow. became brothers at that moment. And it was it just happened without me even realizing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had, I had my feet in both worlds. I would hang I would hang out with my Palestinian friends by day. Hang out with the party with the Jews at night and party with the Israelis party with, you know, um, and it, I was living two worlds. But I, I started to realize what was going on because I was in this neutral spot of being a not being Palestinian, not being Jewish, being a Christian, being a level one Zionist, but then realizing, oh, fuck, this shit is psychotic. Yeah, this so I, I, I did want to bring one point up. So people listening to it, and a lot of these Zionist arguments are predicated on talking points, right? So you're going to a college, you're living yes. in a dorm uh, with both Israelis and Palestinians, right? Am I correct? Yeah, you were correct. Okay. How is My that, dorm was how is that apartheid? How is that apartheid? Oh, yeah. Are you doing a Michael Rappaport video right now? What's going on? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, at first, I was like, "What? What the? Where are we going?" No, with this, so, Greg? sorry, uh, you creep me out, no, no, Greg. I, I'm de <laughs> no, uh, th this is the counter argument. I'm just giving you a talking point from the Zionist. Camp. Okay, great, great question, Greg. So, the counter to that is okay on the surface yeah you know you got muslims and arabs walking around you got palestinians mixed in you got druze you have buddhist we're all holding hands walking tel aviv it looks like a multicultural wonderland except when you start to hear the fucking horror stories from your palestinian friends that talk about all the fucked up shit that happens to palestinians who have israeli citizenship well, that's when really, everything really breaks. quickly really quickly let's back it up right what is tel aviv back it up. <laughs> tel aviv is yaffa right which mm -hmm. is a palestinian yep. village that was ethnically cleansed murdered raped pillaged by the zionist terrorist gangs between 1947 yep. and 1949 is like the accurate because people say 1948 and that's what it's known as mostly but i have friends where the murders started in december of 1947 so when they hear 1948 it really doesn't like you know what i mean uh yeah. it doesn't cover their own family and so but no, michael no no michael uh two men can hold hands in tel aviv they do the pink yeah, washing thing about television. Did you they know always that it's, invoke the pink washing scenes. It's actually not legal for people who are gay to get no. married inside of the occupation. They just like no. present themselves as this 
like safe haven for gays. But then they also engage in blackmailing of homosexual people in Palestine, right? As a form of like getting them to turn spy. Like they'll yep. interpret, they're inter intercepting their text messages, their emails, all that. And then they're using that against people in order to get them to provide information. Yep. yep. They're big at pinkwashing and blackmailing. You know what I mean? Come on. Yeah. So yeah. Bas basically, they only they have these talking points, right? But sometimes, and especially over the past five months, and it's really coming to a head right now, you see the real face of the ideology manifest. And Michael, you sent me this video because you wanted me to play it. It's um, of all things, what is it? Uh, the minister of social equality in front of the Knesset just going on a rant about. Yes, well, I mentioned her earlier. Genocide. Her psychopathic ass. All right. So, uh, in case you're uh, listening on the uh, just to the audio, I am going to narrate some of these subtitles said by the Minister of Social Equality in front of the Parliament. Essentially, Min no, it's Minister uh, for the Advancement of Women is her title. The Minister. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to read the subtitle. She speaks fast, and it's in Hebrew, so. טוב, אדון גייס חמישי, מר כסיף, לא אתה ולא השותפים שלך שמגנים עליך מבית ומבחוץ, מזיזים לנו כהוא זה. הממשלה הזו לא מתמתמת לגביך, אתה יכול להמשיך לחלום שנסיים את הלחימה ללא ניצחון. אנחנו לא מתביישים לומר שאנחנו רוצים לראות את חיילי צה"ל גיבורים, והקדושים שלנו תופסים את סנוואר והמחבלים שלו באוזניים ומורים אותם מכל הרצועה בדרך למרתיש הבא של בן גביר, לא של בר לב או מיכאלי, או במקרה הכי טוב להרוג גבורה כזה. I am personally proud of the ruins of Gaza and that every baby, even 80 years from now, will tell their grandchildren what the Jews did when their families were murdered and raped and their civilians were kidnapped. You and your friends can dream that we will allow you to build a government because if you think that the prize for the rape of women, the beheading and kidnapping of civilians will be to sit in a government of change, you are dreaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah. Okay. I, I want to, all right, the, the, this this infuri this video infuriated me when I saw it. I think like a week ago, when she says, "Every baby will remember what happened that the Jews did this." Are you trying to get the world to hate Jews? Is that your goal with that? You well, psychotic. You have actually stumbled upon the mission of Zionism, right? Is exactly. To get that was people to hate Jews. It was rhetorical. I know. I'm just playing. But it's like no, I know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. that's the type of like, anti-Semitism like, that I'm worried about. You know what I mean? I am not super concerned about memes shared around. That is what I'm scared of. People who are in power and are saying things that are clearly aligning the Jews with support for genocide. It's fucking disgusting. Yeah, I mean... It's basically yeah. the same as taking a Jewish child, grabbing them, and saying, D you're going to remember that we did this, and then shoving a Jewish child. Like, generations to come, what, is, what kind of anti-Semitism is, is he going to experience? You know, like, I'll give, you, I'll give you a reason why this is very personal to me and why I get so infuriated. So, my son is Jewish. My wife is Jewish. She's of Jewish descent. Her great-grandfather cut off their Jewish identity because of anti-Semitism in New York City, right? This is why I'm so passionate about the subject. So when I think about my son's future, and by the way, I'm raising my son to be Jewish. I'm a non, I'm a Gentile, non-Jewish father who's trying to raise his son to be Jewish. I got a bris ceremony on his eighth day. I, I take him to Hebrew school. I take him to synagogue. I want him to be, be proud of his heritage. I want him to read the Torah. I want, I want to do all those things. It's a beautiful thing. But I do not want him attached to anything related to Zionism, and I don't want the world – I don't want him to grow up in a world of, of anti-Semitism as a result of Israel's actions and what Zionism does. So this is why it's so personal to me because I want my son to be proud that he's Jewish. I want it to be a thing where when he says he's Jewish, he can feel everybody just – what they identify that we're Jewish as being, as being people of righteousness, people who have compassion on those who are oppressed. So that's what yeah, – anyway, so sorry. I, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. and but I think that's that's the goal, uh, as you said, uh, to cause anti-Semitism, to cause attack, 
and then to respond with violence, to further justify violence. Because if you look at, I mean, my niche within this conversation has always been from the military and strategic perspective. Every time uh, Israel has advanced territory or attacked, it's um, the argument is that it's in preemptive self-defense. They are taking territory in order to, uh, as in an expression of defensive expansionism. They don't want to take the ground, but they have to in order to, to be safe. So anti-Semitism actually fuels their mili- overriding military strategy, which is to expand into the messianic vision of a greater Israel. Exactly. Zionists have a shared strategy of Nazis and white supremacists, which is separating Jews from society, right? And then locating them in a place where they'll be eliminated, right? It's a shared strategy that they all have. You know, I used to be called a conspiracy theorist for saying that. I, I mean, like whenever you'll I would still be called a conspiracy theorist because the CIA popularized calling somebody a conspiracy theorist in order to undermine the critiques of their coups, right? And I just mm-hmm. like I would like to read from the CIA handbook page that's making its rounds again. Uh, I'll read directly from it. Talk as frequently as possible and at great length. Bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Haggle over precise wordings. Like whenever I hear people talking about anti-Semitism, right now during the genocide of Gaza, when Palestinians don't have food, water, or medicine, I'm like, oh, you are an op. You know what I mean? You are clearly the, here to like steer the conversation away from the liberation yep. of Palestine. Yep. Herzl said, the anti-Semites will be our most dependable friends and anti-Semitic countries allies. And we see that, that today with Germany. I didn't know he said that. He said that in his diaries. And we see that today in Germany, right, who is expressly a Zionist state in the face of waning European support for Zionism. The Zionist entity even had their own Operation Paperclip where they recruited Nazis. And the descendants of Nazis to this day live inside 48 territory lands. And some of them serve in the occupation army, right? Zionism is a continuation of the Nazi project. It's a continuation of the South African apartheid project. And it's a continuation of the white supremacist Jim Crow project in the United States, right? It was like the Avengers of white supremacy. Um, And they all assembled in Palestine to colonize. That's why you see in South Africa after the fall of apartheid, a lot of the settlers left because they were there for the supremacy. Many of them converted to Judaism threw on a yarmulke, started colonizing the West Bank. There's a Vice documentary about it. You know what? You know what's a dead giveaway that the Zionism that established the state of Israel is has nothing to do with Judaism and has everything to do with white supremacy, is how the Mizrahi and the Sephardic Jews and the Ethiopian Jews were looked upon when they immigrated. Yes, you realize that they were immigrant. They were called to immigrate to be a labor force, to be treated as second or third class citizens. Only ben just Gurion to not said they were the below. He said that they below. were inferior. So that's that right there, full stop. That's a dead giveaway. Because, okay, if you're going to claim that Zionism is about just all Jews, okay, then treat them as equal citizens. Treat the, the brown-skinned Jews. That's the true test. But they failed that test, and we just kind of, you know, roll over that little fact. Yeah, so they have sterilized Ethiopian women, giving them involuntary birth control shots. And this has been widely reported in the Zionist media. There's also the case of Solomon Tekka, who was a 18-year-old kid who was murdered by the Zionist police simply for being black. And then the police officer said that he like took a risk not shooting him sooner when he was interviewed, so showed less than no remorse. Um, and that's, you know, an example of many that are talking about a broader, like, problem, right? A, a systemic yep. issue within the entirety of the settler colony, which is that it's a white supremacist yep. project, right? It's meant for European Ashkenazi Jews, and European Ashkenazi Jews are actually not meant for the temperature climate of Palestine. So it's not a great fit, right? A lot of sunburns happening. Right. And if you look at the uh, leading far right parties of the Knesset, uh, you know, Ben Gavir, uh, Yoav Gallant, Netanyahu, uh, the 
educate the women's empowerment lady who just uh, ranted for a while. Uh, yeah, they're all very much European of European descent, and and, and so you, yeah, but so you can see an identi- you can see an identifiable race based caste system like you would see in India and in like some local governments in that part of the world. That's what I saw firsthand when I was in Israel. That's what I saw. And that was another disenchanting thing that I experienced was like, all right, this is a place for Jews, all Jews, you know, and Arabs and Palestinians, like for all of us to get along. Right. And then you see how, you know, lighter skinned Jews would talk shit about browner skinned Jews. Mm -hmm. And then you would hear like this genocidal language about Palestinians. They would call them Arabs as uh, I'll give you an example. When I was at Hebrew university, obviously I was very in tight with all the Palestinians that went to the school. Once you know one Palestinian, you know, a lot of them and you're like, you're in the group. You're, you're part of the brotherhood with them. Like they, they treat you like you're, you're one of their own. And so, you know, I was on campus. I saw this Israeli girl, who was a a guard. She's a security guard. And, you know, she was a little thicky thick. So I, I, you know, I was like, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go flirt with her a little bit. So I sat down, was trying to flirt with her and, you know, talking with her for hours while she's lonely during her shift. And, uh, you know, the vibe was great. Um, But then, you know, one of my Palestinian friends walked past and he says, Hey, Mark, what's up? I'm like, Hey, what's up, bro? And, you know, I hug him, you know, shake hands and said, I'll catch up with you guys later. I sat down with her. She's like, do you know that those guys? I'm like, yeah, they're my friends. They're my buddies. She's like, but they're Arabs. And I'm like, well, yeah, this is the Middle East. There's a lot of Arabs. Last time I checked, they've been here for thousands of years. Where have you been? Like, I didn't, I couldn't register it. Like, like it wasn't that I didn't know where she was going with this. I'm like, yeah, they're Arab. They're Palestinians. What's the, what's the problem? She's like, oh, they're bad. I'm like, what the fuck? What are you drinking? <laughs> like, and that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh mm. my god, what this is like? I feel like I just tra- got transported back to the 19 fucking 30s in yeah. Georgia, and I'm yeah. like, th- this is that's that was the wake up call because at the time I wasn't racist, you know. I, I like I had racism has never been a, it's always been a no go with me, just the way I was raised. My parents didn't raise me that way, and I, you know, my godmother was African. So for me, that concept didn't register with me. I knew it existed, but that was the first time I really experienced like racism to its core right then and there. Racism has always been like, you know, a dog whistle. She was not dog whistling at all. She just said, oh, those Arabs are bad. I'm like, what the yeah. fuck are you talking about? So yeah, that was uh, a, a huge shocker to me anyways. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the people are, and we well, never hooked up. Uh, well, you know, it's for the best. And that's the real tragedy. Huh? Issues. Yeah, it's the re- <laughs> really quick. Can I react to uh? Can I react to May Golan, who the Knesset lady, the Minister Please. of Advancement for yeah. Women, who said that she <laughs> hopes that every baby, even eighty years from now, will tell their grandchildren what the Jews did. Mm-hmm. What she did in that moment is what's known as a uh, Hillary Clinton feminism. Okay, go on. Oh, just a little joke about uh, what we were talking about earlier, how people are like making Hillary Clinton oh. a feminist icon. It's what we call a callback oh, okay. in comedy. Thank you so much. Hi. You know what? Yeah, I, great. I, I'm running on fumes. I'm just screwing it's everything all good, up. Bro. It's all yeah. good. Pick that up in the edit. You know what I mean? That'll be great in yeah, post, yeah. I believe. No, I mean, we're, we're going to yeah fix it in post. Also, You're- in terms of feminism and activism and all the stuff we're talking about, what we're seeing right now in terms of protests in Tel Aviv, or probably more historically known as Yaffa, um, we're looking at a lot of free the hostages protests. We're looking at a mm-hmm. lot of anti-Netanyahu protests. And I think people mm-hmm. are saying like, oh, they want a ceasefire. But I'm just wondering, most of those people really aren't talking about a two-state solution or recognizing Palestinian rights. It's, it's only because their own privileges are affected. And they think no, their yeah. own rights it's are because being- they're it's because it's, it's because their Starbucks is costing a little bit more right now. It's always bring the hostages home. Right. But never what happened to those hostages who were gunned down by the occupation army, waving white <laughs> right. flags, shouting for help in Hebrew. 
right? You don't and, give a shit about the hostages. You just bombed all of Gaza. They were probably underneath all that rubble somewhere. It's uh, it's always release the hostages, but why does Netanyahu keep turning down all of the hostage deals, right? It's always release the hostages, but why did Smotrich say that getting the hostages back was not the most important thing? It's always release the hostages, but never what happened to the guy whose mom claimed that he was gassed to death by the IOF. Yep. Don't mention the thousands of kids in administrative detention. It's always yeah. release the hostages, but the other day the IOF confirmed that they killed one of their own hostages in an airstrike. Like anybody who truly believes this is still about hostages is either ignorant or yeah. illiterate. You look goofy, okay? And yes, those are people largely protesting like judicial reform or some like quieter, less obtrusive occupation. They want to go back to a time when they could ignore Palestinian suffering in peace, when people could go back to debating two state solution instead of calling what it is a genocide and a total occupation, right? There are very few actual allies inside 48 right now because true solidarity looks like leaving. Many of them have other passports and even more are eligible to apply for citizenship elsewhere because they came from elsewhere. And you see people doing that, leaving because supremacy is threatened, just like in South Africa after the fall of apartheid. Yeah, and I think people definitely have a like impression that there are a you know at least a, a leftist wing of allies but it's it's not really about that at all and i do want to talk about something leaving uh when i talk about the end of a colonial project yeah when people start feeling threatened and they have other options and they don't want to die and they you know want to live in peace or at least not have the inconvenience of rocket attacks which get us uh, you know intercepted by american rockets in the iron dome system they're going they're going to leave we've seen an unprecedented number of people leaving israel in the hundreds of thousands over the past few months um can you tell us more about what's going on there so we, yeah it's uh, just we, like we don't have a hard number it's growing. There was 30,000 that was reported in a single day, and that was a month or so ago, and numbers have been up as far as settlers leaving because they do have other passports, they have other options, it's not their land, they don't actually want to die for it, and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they were there for the elevated position of Jewish supremacy. And, you know... They'll, they'll dip to another place if they, like, when they want to. Like, they can and they should. The, uh, during November, the number that I heard as of November was half a million had left. Right, right. So and why is what that? is it now? Why is that? It's because it's not their land, right? It's because they have another passport mm -hmm. that has stamps on it. And they like a quiet life. They're not trying to die for Palestine because they don't have the moral clarity to commit to dying for Palestine like Aaron Bushnell does, right? Oh. They are cowards and they're just there to enjoy the privilege of supremacy. That's why they break children's arms and legs. That's why they snipe pregnant women. That's why, they, that's why they're only undefeated against hospitals. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also um, it's also why this idea of rape, they're so obsessed with it uh, because yes. rape's never about sexual gratification. It's about reinforcing yes. power dynamics. The UN just came out with a report that has, you know, it's one of many reports on the subject documenting the sexual violence that is the occupation army subjects women and Palestinian teenagers to inside these dungeons, as well as men. There's been numerous studies over the course of many years. This is something that is well documented. And then the UN just popped out a brand new report based on what we've been seeing for the last few months, right? And so this is a documented pattern. And then you go back to the things like Tantura, right? I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary, yeah. but it yeah. details the horrific rapes murders that these, you know, military thugs, these freaking terrorist Zionist gangs engaged in as they were, about it. 
Yes, as they were depopulating entire villages, right? Tantura, you- Tantura is every Palestinian village. And that's what I mean when I say that like Tel Aviv is not yet, like, like Tel Aviv is not what it is, right? It's Yaffa, right? Yaffa yep. was tantura into Tel Aviv. Yep. Did you see that old man? Yes, laughing? of course, of course. In his yeah. old age, think about that. Think about that. Years, decades later, when he's had time to repent, life, and he, he doesn't. He's actually he, and he's just chu- he's chuckling. Yeah, that, that level of evil is incomprehensible to me. That's why I imagine a a you know Eichmann looking and like. And what does know? that have to do with Judaism? That's what I would ask anybody who's exactly. like, because that's that man's face laughing at the rape that happened many years ago as they stole the country where he now sits comfortably. That's the face of Zionism. And so if you're confusing that with Judaism, I mean, you really have it out for Judaism. Well, think of the environment that man had to have lived in to have felt comfortable still feeling that way. Yeah. That means he, that means all the, all that, all that terrible ideology had to have been incubated well, up until his see, old age. You see, even right now, there's 60% of Israeli Jews who oppose humanitarian aid, right? Mm. That's a loud majority in favor of genocide. You see them setting up bounce houses outside of the various crossings to stop aid, like it's a clown carnival from hell. They are camping out for fun in order to stop medicine and food. And they're enjoying the genocide of the Palestinian people as a form of entertainment, like they do when they watch the bombs drop, right, on Stereo Cinema. Uh, There's literally a Jewish law to feed the poor, but they're blocking aid trucks during a genocide. Watching this, and it's my understanding that American Jews are more, in general terms, more religious than a lot of Israeli Jews who tend to be secular. Uh, going off of that supposition and the fact that they're not currently like living in Israel, I'm, I'm wondering like how, how seeing how the past five months unfolding, uh, clear, well, at least from my perspective and for our perspective, clear evidence of genocide, genocidal intent in action, in speech, in devices. Um, Do you see any Jews because of this in America turning away from Zionism or beginning to question it? Or is there like a doubling down action that's happening? And of course, it's not a monolith. Y'all aren't a monolith, but are you seeing any trends in that? Yes. I should say I don't speak for all Jews, right? Up yes, top. yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, four Jews, five opinions is the old saying. So, yeah. uh, um, but what I will say is it's funny that they say God gave them the land and then they also don't believe in God, right? So they don't even believe in the basis for which they're there uh, or claim to be there. Yeah. So if you needed any more uh, evidence for just wanting to be uh, uh, supreme, the supreme Ubermensch master race, I think that's it right there. And so what I'll say about U.S. Jews is Mm -hmm. in 2021, I recall a poll that showed that one in four Jews understand that one in four American Jews understand that what's happening in Palestine is apartheid. Right, which is slightly higher than what it has been previously, but that's still just a quarter, right? That means that that year, 75% of Jews had no connection to reality. Yeah, and I just wanted to ask, like, because of that, like, what mental space does Israel occupy for, like, the average Jew living abroad? Is it, how would you characterize it? I mean, it occupies space everywhere it goes. But, right. uh, you know, what I'd say is it's still a very slow process of getting Jews to unlearn Zionist brainwashing because we've all been born into this thing where, mm. you know, a lot of us has, have been raised to support a violent psyop, basically, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it does take some unlearning. And I'd love to, you know, get on this podcast and be like, oh, you know, like so many Jews are waking up to the plight of the Palestinian people. But like, that's just not really the case. Right. There are very few. There I got a thing. There are very few Jews 
who actually understand the severity of the situation and understand that all of Palestine is occupied, right? That the Zionist entity is a genocidal settler colony founded on the forced displacement and murder of Palestinian people, and it must be dismantled in order to save Judaism. That Palestinian refugees must be allowed the right of return, and Jewish supremacy must be abolished. That Zionism is the source of the majority of the anti-Semitism and bad feelings towards Jewish people in the world. And if you claim to be a representative for all Jews, and then you commit genocide for 75 years, you leave folks with a bad feeling towards Jewish people, right? That Zionism in and of itself is anti-Semitic, both when it was Christian at first, and then later when Jews were advancing the project, because it's predicated on separating Jewish people from society and bringing about the rapture, where it's promised most Jews will be destroyed. The number of Jews that actually agree with all of that is like eight to 10, right? <laughs> and we're all in a group text, okay? Uh, it's a lot of Shabbat Shalom's and fuck the occupations. But mm -hmm. every day there are, I would say, dozens more Jews who are unlearning, right? And then mm -hmm. we have to deal with some who are debating whether from the river to the sea is appropriate while Gazans literally starve to death. And those people clearly don't get it, right? And then you have people who are known as normalizers, right? People who are profiting off of the genocide of Palestinians or trying to rehabilitate the image of Zionism through the language of anti-Zionism. They're the modern day cointel pro. Any Jewish person who centers Zionist hostages, anti-Semitism, condemning the resistance, uses the genocide as a means to make money is not somebody who truly cares about the liberation of Palestine. And there is a special place in hell for people who have used this moment for their own personal gain. Plenty have. Lots of money to be made on this conflict. I got a, I got a question for you, and you kind of answered it already. But I want to dive back into it. Okay, so I want to push back on you, not because I disagree with you, but because I want to take an optimistic devil's advocate approach, if I may. Mm -hmm. All right. The whole question of silent majority. So obviously there are many Jews who are passionately vocal and have taken to the protest, but no doubt there are many other Jewish people out there who are in fear of being ostracized, excommunicated, if you would, by family or even in fear of harm. Has this possibly created a silent majority that wants to speak up but feels cautious about it? And how big can we could we speculate that silent majority is? You know, um, I mean, do you know people who are on the fence but are afraid to go all the way? Because I'm a firm believer in the silent majority argument that if you create the impression by releasing false polls that this th this group of people believes a certain thing, that in and of itself is a very effective prop form of form sorry it's a very effective form of propaganda because and i use the ice cream analogy you're a teacher joe you're biden gonna, loves that well all right so joe biden he's up at the front of the class he has 10 students and he wants to get vanilla ice cream but he has to have it up for a vote so he has all the students write down a piece of paper anonymously what flavor of ice cream they want they all fold it up pass it up front eight out of ten want chocolate ice cream but he wants vanilla. So when he counts up the votes, he just tells us, he tells the, uh, the class, you know what? looks like eight out of 10 of you guys wanted vanilla ice cream. So I guess we're having that. And then every, but, but psychologically, everybody in who wanted chocolate ice cream are like, Oh, I guess I'm on the minority then. So they get that social pressure. So um, that's that, uh, how I view these polls. That's how he won the primary over Bernie. Right. <laughs> right. So, now apply that analogy to possibly the Jewish community. Is it possible? Yeah. I mean, so what I'll say is that all? some Jews are slowly unlearning the brainwashing, but it's, as I said, the most powerful psyop that like mankind has ever seen. I'll go as far as to say that because it's so wide reaching. It's infiltrated so many institutions and universities and cultural centers that like it's almost everywhere. Right. And so, you know, uh, but it's largely the elder generation 
that enforces Zionism. And the younger generation has been more susceptible to asking questions based on the lived experience and realities of Palestinians. Sometimes people don't challenge their family's support for genocide because there's a financial burden on being left on their own, right? They may be kicked out of their own house, kind of a Zionist specialty. Uh, and they do it to their own children, right? If you question the death cult of Zionism, you could find yourself excommunicated, not just from your temple, not just from your social circles, but also from your immediate family. And then there's the idea of like not wanting to jeopardize your future. For the longest time, there was a narrative in both Jewish and Palestinian communities that organizing around Palestine could impact your future job opportunities. And frankly, after doing it for many years, I have no idea where that came from. Uh, <laughs> so for many people, they chose their money over morals, right? They chose the possibility of earning cash over the urgency of the situation the moral litmus test of our time, according to June Jordan and Dr. Angela Davis. There's nothing more spineless, more gelatinous than not speaking about a genocide because you want to make money. When I hear people say that, I think, wow, you would have made a great Nazi then, and you are making a great Nazi right now. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up on the, the idea that the, the older generations are the most conservative because I've seen sociological data that suggests that it's actually the youngest, the younger generations that are the most hardcore about Zionism, at least in Israel. I'm not talking in about outside. In 48, yes. In 48, the youngest generation are the most fascist, right? But mm -hmm. inside the United States, the younger generation is leading the rebellion against Zionism. Okay. And so you're gonna, that's going to come to a head at some point, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, the, the kids are a part of the 60% of people who don't want aid to get in during a genocide. They've constructed a bounce house to play at the crossing so that like water can't cross into Gaza, right? Yeah. That is, they're a part of that group. And, you know, those people are from the lowest of the low, like just your regular civilian, alleged civilian, right? Totally unconnected, totally, you know, not responsible for anything, allegedly, that at the lowest level, all the way to like your city councilor, and then the orders are coming directly from the top, right? So it's like the whole society has vertical integration of systemic oppression. Right. And you know what's so sad about this? is you have a whole generation of young Jewish people who want to get in touch with Judaism, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. But where, where do they go? What, where, where do they go that has not been infiltrated by this ideology? It's very it's difficult. Really sad. And, and, and you, do you think that it is uh, a, a small majority then? Well, what I'll say is like there's probably tears, right? Like there are people mm -hmm. who are like truly anti-Zionist who actually believe in – the liberation of Palestine, who believe in returning Palestinian homes to Palestinians who still have the keys, who still have the deeds, right? Who were exiled many years ago or not that long ago. Like that's, there's some of us who believe that. I would say there's probably like 300 of us who actually believe that. And then on a broader scale, there's probably like thousands to hundreds of thousands of people who are on the journey of unlearning Zionism and they're still like thinking the two state solution is a good idea. They don't recognize that it's actually not feasible because the occupation has inserted over 750,000 settlers into the West Bank, has further like condensed people into ghettos um, yeah. and, you know, and like further grabbed land. And obviously now with this latest genocide in Gaza, like they've made life unlivable for Palestinians. So any, any dream of a two state solution is clearly long gone and dead. And if you are still like a Jewish person who's talking about the two state solution, you sound kind of goofy. Um, yeah, but a lot, a lot more people are like susceptible to that than they are to like the full liberation of Palestine, truthfully. Right. It, when I hear all these narratives, especially like backlash against what Aaron Bushnell did the other day and, and the, the desperate uh, attempt to like make it like a mental health thing. And then the second the second no. Biden, the second Biden, you know, talks about a ceasefire. Twitter explodes with Hasbara um, influencers like calling him out because like the second 
apparently you tell them no, they go into a temper tantrum. And it's like yeah. all of this comes from a place of fear. It's like Zionism has created this atmosphere of existential dread where if anything goes wrong or against it, like everybody gets real scared real quick and becomes angry. Yeah, Joe Biden on Seth Meyers was a mental health issue, okay? Aaron Bushnell was yeah. speaking very clearly. And he understood the assignment, right? He knew it needed to be live streamed. He knew it needed to be distributed into like other channels just in case it got pulled from the internet. He wrote a will where he donated like his life savings to Palestinian children. He got somebody to look after his cat. These are not the actions of somebody who's not mentally well. These are actually the actions of somebody who is operating and functioning at a high level. It's also not coming from a guy who had nothing to live for. Like, right. it's not like he was, he, it's not like his life was falling apart and he did right. this because he had nothing to, he was, he had the whole world in front of him. They tried to smear him and the best they could come up with was religious extremist and anarchy. Tough. And by the way, the religious community that he came from, looking back on it, they're Zionists. Very Zionist. No, exactly. Joke, huh? So, yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, was he actually? Yeah. Was he actually Zionist? Well, the the community that historically where he came. Oh from, my God! I'm younger. too good at this shit. That's crazy. Hilarious. No, yeah, no. It, it, they actually said that they were actually Zionist, just like any evangelical group is. Yeah. I mean, they all are. Because Zionism so. is its own religion, right? It just stole it a lot of the characteristics and mannerisms of Judaism and like left the husk of you know, all of the like justice, social rights issues. Yeah. Oh, and I, speaking of which, it's interesting how Israel uses, I, I call, I'm going to invent a new term here, Hebrew washing, right? Like for example, Bibi Netanyahu, what was his original name? His Polish uh, Milikowski. name? Milikowski. Yeah. And he took a word like Netanyahu. Now me, the word Netanyahu, that's a very sacred name. If you're in touch with Judaism, like Netanyahu is a beautiful name that, you know, it means the gift of God, the gift of Yahoo is it even invokes the sacred name, the Merkaba tank. That's the, th that's the chariot that carries the throne of God. These are sacred words in Judaism. You got the, was it David sling? The, you should the really listen to the episode that I did with Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro because he talks uh. about how modern Hebrew is obviously not connected necessarily to ancient Hebrew and like ancient Hebrew paleo uh, Hebrew speakers yeah, it's more would not recognize Japanese. modern Hebrew. And the way that they resurrected modern Hebrew was explicitly to support the settler colony, the Zionist project and yeah. how a lot of the words that they've used, they have changed the meaning. So like they used to be sacred, but now they make a mockery of them. And you're, yep. you're going to love that episode. It's episode 100 of the Palestine Pot Anchor. I'm going to yeah, check that out. We will link it in the description as well. Yeah, yeah great. Okay. All the negative stuff, you know, I want to put on the shelf for a second. I want to focus on like a silver lining. I just want to give a shout out to the Palestinians for creating a safe corridor for Jewish people to escape the prison of Zionism. They have done a badass job of doing that. They have they have welcomed them with open arms and say, hey, look, come over here. It's safe over here. Yes. Get out of that cult. And so shout out to all you Palestinians who have made it comfortable, who have guarded us and protected us as we've left that prison. And they don't get enough cr no. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that I think it's, it, we're witnessing an, an historical event that we've never seen before, an event where Jewish people have actually been allowed to leave this prison, and Palestinians were the ones that broke them out. They're the ones that yep. took a took a sledgehammer, knocked the lock off, opened yep. the door, and said, "Hey, come on, let's get out of here. Get out of here. Come on. I don't I don't hate you because you're Jewish." I don't hate the Jews. You're safe with us. We just hate that ideology. So please get out of there. You don't and even know what it's really about. I want to say that that is it historically tracks with how Palestinians have provided refuge to Jews. Okay. So that actually tracks with how Palestinians have treated Jews historically, because historically Palestinians have always provided a safe haven for Jewish people. The, the people coming from the Holocaust, the Jewish refugees coming from the Holocaust were welcomed in by Palestinian families. They were fed. They were provided clothing, water, medicine. They were 
allowed to stay in the houses of Palestinians. And then the Zionist terrorist gangs kicked out the Palestinians and those same families who sought refuge in the Palestinian houses stole those houses. And that's how you have the creation of the modern state known as Israel, right? That's how Tel Aviv came about, is that Palestinians opened their doors to Jewish people, and then those Jewish people stole those houses. That's how Muhammad Adid's family was kicked out of their house. Yeah, it's one of the saddest things I've ever seen. I feel like, and w when you think about the amount the, the majority of the top brass of the Third Reich got away scot-free from they the Holocaust. Go? Where'd they go? NASA, exactly. CIA, exactly. you name it. All federal agencies. Very few of them actually got prosecuted, in my personal opinion, right? Yes. They went to, if I may, they went to the United States to work in the CIA and intelligence apparatus. They went to yep. Russia to work, work in the KGB uh, over there. They went yep. to the occupation of Palestine. As I mentioned, there are still descendants of Nazis living inside 48, right? And they disappeared to Argentina, where there are entire towns of people who do not speak Spanish. They speak yep. German. German. There's an excellent documentary called the, I think, Hunting Hitler that talks then, about the entire community. Yeah, and then there are still plenty of Nazis in, you guessed it, Germany, right? <laughs> I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to what's going on in Germany recently, but oh, Germany absolutely, absolutely. is cracking down on Palestinians and anti-Zionist Jews who are organizing around Palestine. Let me say that one more time. Germany is doing state violence on people, including Jews, in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. Is that right. ringing alarm bells? I mean, well, yeah, for me it does, but I'm not surprised. My grandmother was German. Uh, it's just, it, it's, it, the culturally, <laughs> they're predisposed to, I, I would say, listening to the government, uh, do it like towing the line, making everything organized and efficient. And if that government hasn't really been denazified and is still fascist AF, well, no one fascists like my people. Let me tell you, like you can try, was, but you're not going to win. <laughs> there was a, like a couple police departments and fraternities inside Germany that needed to be completely disbanded because they were still pledging allegiance to Hitler. That was like yeah. a couple years ago. You know, um, I actually, I was like, I crowd worked a guy at a stand up show recently and uh, he was German. And I was like, oh, wow, this guy doesn't know whether to hate me because I'm Jewish or I support Palestine. Right. And it turned out it was both. Uh, he yeah. would only admit to one, though, you know, so. Yeah, let's yeah. let's let's make that very clear again in, in bold headlines. In Germany, anti-Semitism is going up. As if it wasn't already there. And, and who's also, getting arrested Zion for it? And, and Zionism is going up. Well, there's a direct correlation. As anti-Semitism goes up, Zionism is, and pro-Israeli sentiment is going up. Right. Well, Germany has always been extremely pro-Zionist. They even worked, the Nazis worked with the Zionists to transfer funds to colonize Palestine. It's called the Ha'avra Agreement. And so, you know, now Germany... <laughs> Jews represent 1% of the population and 37% of the people arrested for anti-Semitic offenses since October 7th. Germany is using state power to round up Jews in the name of anti-Semitism. What year is it? Bro, bro, make it make sense. No, no, it's just like the old adage, the more shit changes, the more shit stays the same. So, yeah, yeah because these ideologies take a long time to dismantle if they ever are dismantled. So when we come to something as deeply entrenched as the Nazi ideology or a close corollary in terms of function, a Zionist ideology, yeah, this is going to be around for a while. Like people think like, yes, I do think the Israeli state as it exists now is going to be dismantled and the status quo, we will never return to it. But this, the Zionist ideology ain't going anywhere anytime no. soon. We'll have, no to, we'll have to honestly fight them ideologically everywhere, even after the collapse of their settler colony. We'll have to yeah. defend 
apartheid, even though they're debating Nelson Mandela, right? We'll mm -hmm. have to defend civil rights, even though they're debating Dr. Angela Davis, Kwame Ture, Malcolm X, yeah. right? Absolutely. And like, once it's once Israel changes, they, they'll be lamenting the disappearance of it. They'll be like the make, make America great again. You know, like mm. when we get when we go back to Jim Crow, when we go back yeah. to like segregation. So ideally, yeah, it's not going anywhere. this is this is my ideal is that the occupation of Palestine is known like Rhodesia, where it's like, oh, okay. you really only know about it if you were there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people still speak the language. Some people still talk about it. But by and large, you ask people what Rhodesia is. They're like, I have no idea. And I am of the belief that in the very near future, the occupation of Palestine will be Rhodesia. OK, just so you know, Rhodesia is what is currently Zimbabwe. Yes, but it was a white settler colony that was set up in Africa and mm -hmm. was used to like steal the resources, etc. Yeah. Again, more shit changes, the more it stays the same. Yeah. Anyways, that's probably All a good right. place to wrap up. I got to go soon, guys. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on and doing a free form talk about Zionism, um, yeah. anti Semitism, and all the dynamics in between. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Yeah, Michael. I love your vibe too, man. I Thanks, like the bro, way yeah. you uh, kind of uh, pull out all the stops and we could just kind of talk more openly and just, you know, put some passion into it. So, oh, bro, I have uh, dedicated my life to this and I'm working every single day. I mean, I have family that was murdered in the Holocaust, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. how could I possibly sit by idly? as the same thing happens to the Palestinians right now. Like it's incumbent upon every Jew who truly values the memory of people who died in the Holocaust to stand up against injustice everywhere, whether it's in Palestine or Sudan or Congo or here in the United States, right? Jews should be focused on justice. Oh, and by the way, one more thing I would say, remind people that people who believe in an Islamist conspiracy theory and people who believe in the Jewish conspiracy theory are the same types of fucking people. If you think that Muslims are trying to take over the world, and you, th those are the same types of people who believe that Jews are trying to take over the world. The same racist motherfuckers who think the same thing. It's so, the same type of ideology that's kind of reductive and misses the point, right? Yep. There are multinational corporations that are run by all types of people, whether they be Christian yep. Zionists or Jewish Zionists wow. or... Wasps, you know, yeah, white exactly. Anglers, like some Protestants, the the people who are worried about a specific religion should really Google the Trilateral Commission. They should Google the Council on Foreign Relations. They should Google the Atlantic Council because these are the people, like the so-called shadow government, who are like truly making calls about foreign policy. I used to work for a high level democratic donor and I once sat in on a meeting for the Atlantic Council. I heard about the Syrian revolution in 2010 in Manhattan Beach. Mm. It didn't pop off till 2011. You know what I mean? I was talking to John McCain's aides and stuff before he's pictured with FSA fighters. So it's like these folks are the folks you should be worried about. And incidentally, yep. we will be doing um an episode on big, big league donors and uh, capital manage asset management firms in the near future. But again, yeah. thank you so much, Michael, for coming on. Yeah, and uh, we're going to link his Instagram and Pally podcast, Palestine, Palestine Pod, Pod. In, uh, in the description. And we will see you in a couple days. Cheers, y'all. Nice so to meet much. you, brother. Nice to meet you as well. Appreciate you guys.